Okay. Um, hello to everybody, both those present in this in this room of the Palacio de la Regione Toscana, and those who are watching us through through the web, through internet, because this is being live streamed. Um, we are here to talk about uh, distribution and climate uh, policies and, and, and climate change impacts. Uh, we are now in the middle of our annual conference in FSR Climate at the European University Institute. We have you know, a group of academics, mostly economists, or I could say all of the economists attending this, this annual conference. And uh, most of the papers, most of the concerns of economists deal with uh, deficiency, with uh, cost effectiveness of uh, policy instruments, which is very, very important in this, in this area because, I mean, we are facing really important policies, really, um, you know, massive policies, and we need to guarantee that these policies are cost effective. So it's a major issue. But of course, these policies may, may have also distributional effects, will have also distributional effects. And here we are to discuss these things, right? And uh, we have a first level round table. And uh, our idea, but who knows how this round table will evolve because uh, we want to have a dialogue with the, with the participants uh, here with all these people who, who are with us uh, in, this, in this room and, and between us. Uh, but our original idea in FSR Climate was to, to organize this uh, deba debate uh, into these distributional discussions on, first of all, at a national level. So, I mean, if we have, you know, important climate policies, relevant climate policies, who will pay for them? I mean, will be those uh, with less income, less wealth, um, the ones who pay for, for, for climate policies? In that case, can we compensate them? And that's one of the issues, right? Second issue could be the international dimension. dimension. I mean, we've been talking uh, during part of the day about uh, this topic, and, and of course, I mean, uh, implementing climate policies at the world ne level, having a, an international agreement on climate change will have uh, different uh, distributional impacts and the idea is, I mean, how relevant this is and how this can be overcome uh, so that a global agreement, for instance, can be achieved. And then there is the third issue, which is intergenerational um, mm -hmm. distribution of costs and benefits from climate policies. And uh, in that case, again, I mean, this is a very, very relevant, relevant issue. We've been talking about this, about how, you know, the probability of, of, of extreme events uh, far away in the future or not so far away in the future, in the future are, are there. And therefore, this is really um, very, very worrying. So, I would ask uh, the public uh, to participate uh, here I mean, uh, and, and give your, your, your opinions. But before that, let me introduce uh, the, the participants and also I will give them uh, you know, the floor uh, for a few minutes so that they can deal with some or all these issues uh, as a preliminary kind of a warming up of the, of the debate. Uh, we have uh, two hours almost, so plenty of time to, to talk. We don't need to, de to deplete the, the time in case we, we don't have more, more things to say or, or, or to discuss, but uh, I doubt it. So let me, let me start uh, introducing from my, from my right to the, to the left. And uh, we have Ian Parry. Uh, he's principal environmental fiscal, poli fiscal policy expert in the fiscal affairs department of the IMF. But before that, I mean, all of us academics here know Ian a lot because of his academic work when he was um, in Resources for the Future. He is PhD in economics from the University of Chicago 
and uh, his research focuses on models to quantify for different countries the economic impacts of inefficient levels of a wide range of environmental, energy and transportation policies. He has published widely in many journals uh, and other publications. Here, to my immediate right, I, we have uh, Jose Ignacio García Jiménez. He is director of the Jesuit European Social Center, Center in Brussels and he's editor of Eco Jesuit. He joined the Jesuits in 1983 and he has been Catholic priest since, since 1998. He has been lecturer of agricultural economics and social ethics at INEA College of Agriculture of the University of Valladolid in Spain. He's graduate in economics and business administration from ICADE, Pontifical University of Comillas in Madrid, in philosophy, Complutense University in Madrid, and in theology, again, Pontifical Comillas University in Madrid. To my left, I, we have uh, Stephen Smith, professor of economics at University College London. He began his career in the government economic service and then worked at the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London as well, where he was deputy director from 1990 to 1997. St Stephen Smith joined UCL full-time as professor of economics in, in that year, and he was head of the economics department for five years after 1997, and executive dean of the UCL Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences between 2007 and 2013. At UCL, he teaches and researches in public economics and environmental economics. And finally, we have Martin Weitzman, professor of economics at Harvard University. He has been elected as a fellow of the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, published widely in many leading economic journals and has written three books. The last one, Climate Shock, well known to probably all of you. Weitzman's interests in economics are broad and he has served as consultant for several well-known organizations. His current research is focused on environmental economics, including climate change, the economics of catastrophes, cost-benefit analysis, long-run discounting, green accounting, and comparison of alternative instruments for controlling pollution. So thank you, thanking you all for being here and I would also like to thank uh, a lot uh, Regione Toscana for allowing us to, to do this here in this very beautiful palace, uh, just uh, in the Piazza del de Duomo, in the very center of Florence. Regione Toscana has, uh, has been always very, very, very nice to us because, you know, has been collaborating with us in the last uh, uh, months, uh, given their interest in climate change uh, policies and climate change issues. So after this, let me... Um, give the, the floor for a few minutes to, to Ian Parry, then I will, sorry, first of all to Stephen Smith, then I will go to, to Ian, and Martin, and finally to, to, to Jose Ignacio for a few words uh, few, in, during some minutes, and then we'll start the, the debate. So, Stephen. Thank you, Shavir, um, and thank you for the invitation to speak at this, this event. In his introduction, Javier um, identified at least three major distributional issues that arise in thinking about climate policy. One being a question, a distributional question across countries. There'll be countries that stand to lose the most from climate change. There'll be countries that have um, perhaps less or see less urgency um, in dealing with climate change and may nonetheless have to contribute substantially to any international solution. The distribution of costs and benefits, the distribution of burden sharing in any international climate deal is clearly going to be an important element um, in making a deal happen. Secondly, he said there were, he mentioned distributional effects across generations. This is a problem in which um, many of the people most harmed by climate change and who will stand to benefit the most from climate change policy are people as yet unborn, many generations ahead. And yet, some of the most important actions that will be taken will be taken by earlier generations, ours and, um, 
and the, the generations immediately following. So there's an important issue there about the distribution across generations um, that I think is unprecedented in, um, in economic policy. And thirdly, there are questions about the impact of policy, the actions that we might take um, to tackle climate change in terms of their distributional impact within countries. And in thinking about what I might say to, be, to start this discussion off, I thought I'd focus on that and just say one or two, um, one or two words on that particular issue. How far will climate change adversely affect poorer households in society? Is there a real problem there? Um, and what can be done um, to address it? My starting point for this, and I think it's important to make this clear, is that I think any long-run effective climate policy is going to involve carbon pricing of some form. I think price instruments are going to be an indispensable element of successful climate policy um, in the long run. And the reason for that is that we need massive behavioral change across all areas of production and consumption. And the idea that we could achieve this simply through some kind of limited um, direct regulation um, in which the government passes laws that stipulate that things should be done in a, a less carbon-hungry way, um, I think that, that idea is completely unrealistic. It, to do this by regulation would require detailed and intrusive intervention in all areas of the working of the economy. It would risk um, overemphasizing some areas um, where intervention was easy and perhaps imposing excessive costs um, in the form of um, costly abatement in areas um, that are easily, easily regulated um, when it might be more efficient to achieve adjustments elsewhere. Pricing is the mechanism that avoids those problems and I think pricing in the long run is going to be needed um, to tackle climate change. But pricing equally brings with it the problem that the impact of higher, ta higher prices for carbon imposed perhaps as a result of carbon taxes or um, emissions trading, other mechanisms that um, price carbon. That brings with it the problem um, that the additional costs of energy and of um, products that are energy intensive in manufacture will have to be borne by the consumers of those products. And if the in in increase in the price of carbon is going to be as large as some um, modeling suggests, 30 euros per ton or more for the carbon price in the long run, households and, will, households and consumers will face higher bills, higher bills for energy, higher bills for energy intensive goods. And this will naturally provoke resistance and opposition. Um, and the, one of the focuses of that opposition seems likely to be the adverse impact on poorer households. In some countries already that has become a live and difficult issue in policy making. Um, and I think it will be inevitable that as the price of carbon rises, issues of that sort come to the fore um, with even greater political prominence. So the two things I thought I ought to focus on in this very brief introduction, first of all, an observation or two about how far we should expect carbon pricing to harm the poor more than um, other groups. Is this something that's likely to bear particularly heavily on poorer households? And secondly, what mechanisms there might be available to offset any effects, any adverse effects um, that we, we identify. In thinking about the impact on the poor, I think it, there's an important distinction to draw between um, carbon prices or taxes that increase the cost of household energy used for heating and lighting and taxes that increase the cost of energy used in particular as motor fuels. I think in most European countries, and I think in most countries, um, it'll be the case that additional taxes on motor fuels will not be something that will be borne disproportionately by poorer households. Indeed, the poorest households in most European countries don't own motor vehicles, are very heavily reliant on public transport, and are going to be perhaps less affected by increases in motor fuel prices and motor fuel taxes um, than the population average. 
But the area that does potentially cause concern um, is the impact of higher energy taxes um, on household energy bills directly in the form of energy for heating and lighting, perhaps also um, indirectly um, through other areas of consumption. And in particular, household energy costs for heating and lighting um, can take a very large part of the income of the poorest households in society. The proportion of income taken um, by these categories of spending is roughly double for the poorest 10% in the population in the UK and some other European countries compared with the average um, of the population as a whole. And it's clear that the impact of these taxes um, on poorer households um, is, a, is an area of legitimate concern, but also I think potentially an area where selling pricing to the population is going to be um, quite, a, quite a difficult task. But it's clear too that things can be done to offset this effect. It's clear that carbon tax carries within it the mechanism for compensating um, the poor for the, the impact of the additional taxes that they bear because, of course, it generates revenues. And we have the opportunity to use those revenues constructively for purposes um, that can, um, can generate social benefit. Some part of the revenue that's raised from a carbon tax could be devoted directly to compensate poorer households, those most badly affected um, by um, the, the introduction of a carbon tax, through, the through increases in social benefits um, and other, um, other forms of assistance. That doesn't need to take a very large part of the revenue, but it provides the opportunity to directly compensate um, for some, um, some of the um, most uncomfortable distributional effects. The bulk of the revenues, I'd suggest, should be used in other ways, and particularly, I think there is a strong case for using the bulk of the revenues to cut the rates of other taxes, the rates of income tax, payroll tax, value-added tax, the taxes that are distortionary in our economy, and to, by doing so, um, to use the revenues in a way that improve labor market incentives. But this will give the poor relatively little benefit, since, after all, they pay relatively little in these taxes in the first place, and therefore um, the reductions in taxes cannot be seen as a mechanism for offsetting um, the, the distributional problem that potentially arises um, in, in the introduction of um, higher energy prices. The final thought that I'd make is, uh, suggest is that not only should we target assistance to the poor in the form of additional cash benefits, but there may also be a strong case for using some portion of the revenue to improve the energy efficiency of the houses in which the poor live. That may lie at the heart of a lot of the distributional problem um, concerning um, the impact of high energy taxes. And tackling that may actually be more, a more effective way of dealing with the adverse impacts on the poor than any other potential use of the revenues. Let me stop at that point. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Ian? Yeah, um, um, yeah, I'll just make a few uh, brief remarks about different uh, dimensions of uh, climate policy and uh, equity issues. I mean, first of all, just following up on what uh, Steve said, I mean, I think I'm pretty much in complete agreement. We don't think that um, distributional considerations should uh, necessarily hold up uh, progress on carbon pricing at the domestic level. And that's because, as Steve was saying, I mean, holding down energy prices uh, below levels that are warranted on the grounds of supply costs and environmental costs, that's just a very uh, inefficient uh, way to help uh, poor households, because most of the benefits, typically 90% or more, uh, leak away to higher income groups. So instead, we'd recommend that uh, countries move ahead uh, with carbon pricing um, but it is important to compensate the uh, uh, low-income groups through uh, targeted uh, measures. So, and, and I think for advanced countries, uh, we can largely do that through just adjusting um, existing social security uh, 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 systems and um, fiscal uh, measures, uh, even, uh, earned income tax credits, um, childcare tax credits, and so on. And uh, typically, that's only going to use up about 10% of the carbon pricing revenues. I think it's more challenging for developing countries where a large portion of the poor uh, may not be registered taxpayers or uh, benefit recipients. So there, we, we may need to think about um, other uh, measures, um, such as um, 
jobs programs, targeted interventions in um, health, um, education, housing, possibly subsidizing clean fuel alternatives. And these, these sorts of measures, uh, they're, they're going to involve higher leakage rates to the uh, non-poor. So I think that um, uh, research is uh, especially useful, firstly, on the um, incidence across different household income groups of carbon pricing in a wide range of countries. I think we have a pretty good sense of the distributional impacts across um, certainly the United States and many advanced countries, but we need to apply that much more broadly because, you know, 150 uh, countries have made emissions mitigation pledges for the Paris conference. And uh, you know, so a large group of countries presumably will start to take some steps to uh, mitigate um, emissions. So it's very important that we have a, a sense of the um, distributional incidence of potential uh, mitigation uh, measures. In particular, governments need to know, well, how much do we need to compensate uh, low-income groups uh, for the uh, impacts of higher energy prices? Because again, as uh, Steve was saying, uh, these, these compensation measures, they're costly because they're diverting revenues away from the government's budget, and basically they, they, they mean, that means that uh, uh, other taxes must be uh, higher, taxes that are harmful to economic activity and incentives. And then in addition, I think we need a lot more research on the appropriate uh, combination of instruments to address, uh, to compensate poor uh, households in different countries. Um, at an international level, I'm not sure that uh, distributional considerations should hold up carbon pricing either. Because clearly, I mean, the, the success of the Paris Agreement is really going to hinge on the actions of the uh, a handful of large emitting countries. 20 countries account for uh, almost 80% of uh, global greenhouse gases. So, you know, if, if there's a particular low income, very small emitting country that's saying, well, I'm not. I'm reluctant to move ahead with uh, carbon mitigation unless I receive some compensation. I mean, for practical purposes, that's not really a big uh, issue. It's, what, it's, it's the actions of the large emitters that count. Clearly, within that group, we have some uh, developing emerging market economies, China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Russia, South Africa, and uh, so on. But um, a fair amount of a carbon pricing is actually in these countries, and, and advanced countries as well, it's actually in their own interests when you take into account the domestic environmental benefits from carbon pricing. Most importantly, the reduction in air pollution deaths as carbon pricing reduces the use of coal and uh, diesel fuel and uh, so on. And actually, we've been trying to quantify the magnitude of these domestic environmental benefits at the uh, IMF. We have country-level estimates of these benefits. And uh, for most countries, these uh, benefits are amounting to 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars per ton of CO2 or more. So we think that these countries uh, can move ahead with carbon pricing and up to a point actually make themselves uh, better off because of these domestic environmental benefits outweighing the domestic carbon mitigation uh, costs. Uh, so that's, that's one of our key messages, that it's in your own interest to get started on carbon pricing, and if it's the case that China and India are better off from a certain amount of carbon pricing, it's not necessarily clear to me that they, uh, <laughs> that warrants a lot of uh, compensation for those countries when they're doing something that's in their own national uh, interest. And then a third set of issues, I mean, some developing countries are saying, well, uh, we're not going to move forward uh, with our mitigation pledges for Paris unless there's an agreement on uh, climate finance. That's the issue of uh, advanced countries have pledged to mobilize $100 billion in climate finance for uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation projects in developing countries, $100 billion uh, each year from 2020 onwards. And uh, according to a report that's just been released by the OECD, which has kind of been used by uh, country governments as the uh, basis for uh, measuring climate flows, last year in 2014, there was about $60 billion of uh, climate finance flowing to um, developing countries, roughly speaking, split equally between uh, contributions, flows through uh, multilateral development banks like the World Bank, uh, bilateral contributions uh, from, uh, or government donations, and then private flows that are leveraged off these two uh, public sources. But, but one potential concern is that uh, maybe uh, not all of this uh, climate finance 
is, a, is additional. I mean that uh, maybe some of this climate finance is crowding out uh, overseas development assistance that would have taken place in the absence of the uh, climate finance. For example, as far as I understand it, most of the climate finance that's flowing through multilateral development banks is really from a reallocation of capital across different projects rather than an increase in the capital base of uh, the uh, banks. So in my view, that uh, enhances the attractiveness of uh, scaling up climate finance with new sources of uh, public revenues where this concern about uh, additionality may not be uh, 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 as severe. Uh, and in our view, uh, carbon pricing uh, is an attractive source of uh, public uh, uh, of climate finance. If, if advanced countries were to uh, implement carbon prices of $30 per ton by 2020, which is uh, less than what they'll ultimately need if they're serious about uh, meeting the uh, emissions mitigation pledges they've uh, made for Paris, which will ultimately involve prices of 50, maybe even $100 per ton by 2030. So if they were to have in place carbon pricing of $30 per ton by 2020 and earmark just 5% of those revenues for climate finance, that would raise $25 billion. Uh, uh, we also think charges on international aviation and maritime fuels are an attractive source of climate finance. Again, they could raise about $25 billion. Uh, one reason they're attractive is that um, domestic governments have a much weaker claim on the tax base for these uh, sources than for uh, domestic fuels. And then finally, one, uh, one final point on climate finance is that uh, I think a lot of small island states and uh, low-income uh, countries are uh, unhappy with the allocation of climate finance at the moment. Because I think about 86% of the current flows are uh, for mitigation, only 14% is for uh, adaptation. So I think that uh, we, we need to do uh, more research on, what's the, on, on formulas for the uh, appropriate allocation of this finance. Firstly, between mitigation and adaptation, and secondly, within adaptation, how do we think about what's an, uh, an appropriate allocation of these funds across different countries, accounting for both uh, efficiency and uh, distributional uh, concerns? Thanks, Jan. Uh, Martin. Thanks. I want to be quite brief in my comments, uh, both to allow plenty of time for discussion, which is the spirit of, uh, uh, of this round table and audience participation. Uh, besides, much of what I have to say repeats what uh, has already been said, although I'll take a different angle, maybe. Um, I'll give, I want to give some personal reactions to the Pope's encyclical. Um, among other things, this is a, a deep and rich document, but among other things, the encyclical focuses on the morality or immorality of what you might call the standard economic uh, paradigm, which I suppose is a largely capitalist paradigm or model. And uh, it, it, can, it has powerful imagery, uh, it's sincerely articulated. Uh, it's an impressive document uh, in its way. Now, what is my own take on the standard economic paradigm? It's this. Lots of different systems have been tried. We've had centuries of experimentation with various alternatives uh, to, uh, to a capitalist system. And as a system, capitalism is better than these alternative economic systems. I think we can allow that generalization. Um, uh, uh, and history really supports, uh, supports uh, this. Uh, there are three big potential failings of the standard paradigm or of, uh, of capitalist systems, in my opinion. One is that the system breeds inequality uh, the degree of inequality depends upon lots of different things uh, in the society, but the system itself does not contain within itself a mechanism for promoting um, equality. Um, my own personal take, and I think this is representative of most Americans, is that the really bad thing about inequality, the especially bad thing, is not that 
somebody invents some new things or stumbles on a new invention or something like that and becomes much rit richer than his or her neighbors, it's that it, there is not a level playing field for the children. That's the big problem to me with inequality, that uh, children are coming into the world, some of which are tremendously advantaged, some of which are tremendously disadvantaged. Uh, this is the worst side to me of, uh, of inequality. Um, a second problem or failing, uh, potential failing of capitalism is the existence of macroeconomic states with bad features like unemployment and inflation uh, in particular. And a third thing that uh, is a problem with the standard paradigm uh, or with standard capitalism, you might call it, is that there are externalities. There are things like pollution, uh, which the system gives rise to. And here I'm mostly going to be focusing on too high levels of greenhouse gas uh, stocks in the atmosphere. And there is no, the, the capitalist system by itself cannot deal with, uh, with, uh, with these externalities. Uh, there are public goods, there are externalities. Um, I think, though, that uh, I think this would be a shared opinion. There's some public government uh, intervention. Uh, so uh, there are public goods, there are externalities. Um, I think, though, that uh, I think this would be a shared opinion. Three defects of capitalism, a sort of what you might call a semi-practical decomposition decomposability. You can sort of deal with the run problem, each of these three problems on their own. Of course, there's some overlap and there's some spillover, naturally. But uh, you can basically take them one at a time and talk about what instruments or policies we have put into place uh, to deal with these uh, three things. And for inequality, we can help alleviate that by progressive income taxation, by various forms of redistribution, and with policies that help the poor and in uh, to be consistent with this notion that uh, what's worst about inequality is that it 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 it, it does not it, it it's a not level playing field for children. We can emphasize spending on schooling and various infrastructure that could help uh, poor children. Uh, so this is what uh, what I favor personally for bad macroeconomic states. All right, we have a well, pretty well-developed uh, story about macroeconomics. There's some dissension, but basically we have models or conceptualizations of Keynesian-type po government policies that aim to keep unemployment uh, down and inflation down. Now, these, there are varying degrees of success of that throughout the world, but it's not at all as if somebody hasn't thought about this and come up with uh, basic ideas about how to deal with uh, unemployment and inflation. It's still a difficult set of issues uh, for a capitalist country to deal with as we're witnessing now in this period of the last five years or so. Now, for climate change, which is a pollution externality from greenhouse gases, I'll join my economics colleagues in saying that the core problem is a market failure or a missing market in carbon dioxide. So there's a zero price or penalty on carbon dioxide emissions. Actually, if you go around the world and aggregate, uh, there on net, uh, the, um, carbon dioxide is being subsidized at a fairly high rate of about five to ten dollars per ton of carbon dioxide in various forms. Uh, it's concentrated on country oil-rich countries like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, etc. But it, it adds up to and Russia. It adds up to an awful lot. Uh, uh, the, on net uh, 
uh, carbon dioxide emissions, if anything, are subsidized. They are, not, uh, they are not penalized. But these carbon dioxide emissions cause damages. They don't go through the marketplace. So the market price of carbon uh, burning uh, technologies is, is not, uh, it, it shows no price. There's zero price or penalty on CO2 emissions. And I say, as I said, if anything, uh, these are subsidized. So we need to put a price on carbon dioxide. Uh, it's not going to be a price that a market is going to set because there is no private market in carbon dioxide. There's private markets in lots of things, uh, uh, bread, food, private markets on many things that are out there, but not on carbon dioxide, which is an externality. And it's the leading uh, bad externality in the world uh, right now, I would say. So. The encyclical misses an opportunity, in my opinion, to emphasize the need to correct this missing market by putting a uniform price on carbon dioxide emissions. Climate change, in my view, and the view of many others, arises not so much from immoral behavior as from a failure to put a price on carbon dioxide that reflects its true social, uh, the true social cost of carbon. Uh, that's what it is. It's not so much that people are selfish or greedy. They're not seeing this signal. We can work with them uh, on putting in a price of carbon that will incentivize uh, lower emissions of carbon dioxide. So it missed this opportunity to deal with this, uh, what I would call a little more subtly. Uh, now suppose a tax were levied on carbon dioxides with revenues largely going to improve the living standards of the poor. What is wrong with that? And why is that, and, and why, why, is, why doesn't the encyclical say that this is a good idea, this is a, this is a, this is a, uh, a good plan? Uh, I don't see how anyone, uh, any of the writers of the encyclical, or maybe the Pope himself, if I can speak, uh, would find something wrong with this. Uh, this is a very attractive and practical to me approach. The idea is we should be making war against carbon, uh, not against capitalism in general, not against self-interest, but against carbon. So you should stick it to carbon, uh, make war on carbon. Don't make war on capitalism and on uh, individual incentives. So these are my thoughts. Thank you, Marty. Uh, Jose Ignacio. Thank you very much for being here. I thought my presence was uh, maybe not easy, but now listening to Professor Martin, I think it's almost impossible. How can justify? <laughs> so I feel a bit unfair. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, I, I'm not going to react fully because probably we'll have uh, time later for, for that. But uh, I. I think I have to, to react a bit. Um, I think the problem for the encyclical, and I'm here because of the encyclical, so it's the only reason I'm here. Um, and I think it's good, not good that I'm here, because I'm very happy of being here, but I think it's good because this means that the climate issues is not only discussion of experts, that it is and will be for a long time, uh, it's not only discussion of scientists, and because it is and it will be for a long time, and it's not only a discussion of policy makers that it is and will be for a long time, but it's also a social issue and the number of stakeholders is growing. And when more people is in the conversation, I think it's more difficult to reach an agreement, but if the agreement comes, probably will be stronger and people will feel committed with the, uh, the solution. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where to go. Uh, <clears throat> I think the encyclical um, is not dealing with carbon because I think the encyclical is dealing with people and people is a little more complex than carbon. Um, and this is the issue. From a faith perspective, we are dealing with a moral question that is not only climate change, 
but is human behavior. And because human behavior is capable to control markets and to control production inside, but looks like human behavior is not capable to control externalities. Um, so the encyclical wants to address both what is control and what is not control. What we are capable to put a price and we're not capable to put a price. Because the meeting point is the human action is, is producing all this. So for the encyclical capital is, is not the problem neither. Uh, the problem is what we are doing in our societies. And the Pope says in the encyclical that this is not a, um, an environmental crisis, it's not a social crisis, but it's both. It's social and environmental. I understand today it's not so popular to talk about a social crisis because we just talk about poverty and it seems to be enough in a world that is capable to help many people to live behind poverty. But um, inequality for many people still is, um, uh, is a difficult line to cross. So <clears throat> I think we are still facing a, a social crisis. And when we look around societies and we see youth unemployment or lack of employment, uh, the conditions of many jobs, uh, how life is in our own societies, even we have possibilities, of course, I think it makes sense to talk about the human ecology that is not working properly. And from a religious perspective, it, it, it's all connected. And I think this is the strongest message of the encyclical. It's all connected. The life of the people, the way the life of the people is, and all the economic framework it takes place. So I think it's not against capitalism and silical, but it's how capitalism is touching the lives of many, many people. <clears throat> so for the encyclical claim that the environment is a common good, and it means that to deal with the common good, uh, we can fix, as, as Professor Weisman was saying, we can fix one problem after another, but if we lose the whole perspective of the issue, then probably we, in the, in, in the way we are losing people and we are putting people aside. Um, <clears throat> so the encyclical, yes, the encyclical uh, is quite demanding with the role that technology can play and it's suspicious of, it's true, it's suspicious of the way technology is moving these days. And we know that technology seems to be neutral and always good, but I think it's fair to say that not everybody looks technology in the same way. Or at least some people is not so convinced or fully convinced that technology is moving in this neutral way. The role of, of economics and mostly of finance is very difficult to explain any citizen today in Europe that finance is playing a good role in our lives when clearly we see that finance has failed or at least the financial system has failed. <clears throat> Certainly the role of politics is crucial. I think capitalism can be well understood in a democratic framework. Uh, without a democratic framework, it's difficult to, to understand how, uh, how capitalism works. Although no democratic regimes, uh, they use capitalism. But all this shadow about who is taking decisions and who is benefiting from decisions, we can understand much better in democratic systems. So lack of democracy is a, a strong question. And <clears throat> the Pope, uh, the encyclical, what is the strongest call is for dialogue. And I think this dialogue, um, for me, it's very interesting this afternoon how, how we can learn a lot. And I'm probably if the Pope will be here, he would like to add a paragraph about carbon, uh, carbon markets. The encyclical has any religious text because it's a, it's a 
text for the believe, community of believers, although it can be read and encouraged to read for many other people, <clears throat> um, talks about this idea of ecological conversion. How we can understand our future integrating life of the people and the environment. And mostly how we can look to the future integrating life of the poor people and environment. And this is one strong call for this. And this is a contribution from, from a community of believers. Um, <clears throat> price can be a good tool, taxes can be a good tool, but the, the level of the, of the change, of the level of, of, of the implications we are looking forward in, in the future will demand much more than that. So how can we justify sacrifices to communities and to people? How we can suggest today we have to make an effort for future for people we don't know yet? How we can understand that our consumption uh, style needs to be limited in some ways? Well, uh, churches deal a lot about conversion and it takes a lot of energy to try to convert in people. So we know how difficult is people change their minds and their understanding of life. Uh, so I think the encyclical is calling for, for this, an ecological conversion that will integrate a new perspective or at least a new way of looking to the life of the people and the environment where this life takes place. So for us, as community believers, we, we talk about the real conversion that has to integrate mostly and put in the forefront precisely the life of the, pure, the poor are marginalized. So this, this will be the criteria, one of the strongest criteria for, for this. So um, when we are talking about how we can price, maybe it's, um, we first price and then we consider what we can do with the poor people. Maybe what we can do for the poor people and then try to find out what is the right price. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Ignacio, and uh, I want to thank you especially for, for being here in, in front of a community of, of, of economists uh, who are believers uh, in, in carbon prices, in carbon prices, right? And, 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 and in a way, I mean, probably the only, the only, the only people, uh, who, I mean, we were mentioning these days that uh, uh, Carbon pricing is a very popular uh, issue among us, but probably just among us, right? So, 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 so thank you for, for being here. And the only thing that uh, gives me some, some relief is that you are also an economist, right? <laughs> so, so I'm sure that you think, uh, you think in some ways uh, similar to us with respect to, to, to this, right? And um, we wanted to bring you, uh, not to put you in, in, in a difficult situation, but just to have, or, or just to have the church here as, as, as the Catholic Church, but just to have a, a different uh, perspective and, 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 and to be able to discuss, uh, you know, because you say that the encyclical letter is for believers, uh, for people with faith, but, uh, but I think it's also for the global community, you know, and, and it's, it's some, at some stage, uh, it says so in the encyclical letter that, that uh, of course, is mainly directed to Catholics, but also aimed to, to a global audience and also to other religions as well. So that's why you are here. I mean, you are uh, you are here to give us, you know, this outside, uh, you know, like uh, uh, ideas uh, from from this topic. Um, I would. Well, first, uh, perhaps give uh, some some immediate reactions for, for, from from the table, and then I would immediately uh, give uh, give the floor to the to the uh, to the to the public, to the audience. Yes, just just very briefly, I think we've we've covered quite a lot of ground here, um, but I think one thing that um, is forces us to confront ethical issues in a way that is quite rare in economics. Um, is the intergenerational dimension of climate change. I think we can read many things we can read off from existing economic and financial behavior in ways that are illuminating and help us understand how to make policy. But I think in this area of policy, we actually 
need to make judgments that are not easy to draw down from what else we see people doing and the judgments that we see people making in their everyday lives. We, we typically don't trade with generations as yet unborn. We typically don't have much appreciation or need to interact with them or to think about them. And yet here we're confronted with a, an issue in policy making in which the major beneficiaries are people who, who are living 100 and 200, 100 years ahead. And that, I think, um, is difficult for us to handle with, as it were, the basic toolkit. And I think does, does put us in a, in a position where we have to think rather harder about some of the underlying um, values and ethical ob objectives that, we're, that, that, that we have. Any, any other reaction, Arti? Yeah. 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 Uh, I think that trying to be a little fair with the text also of the encyclical and the position, uh, probably it's true that it has not gone so deep in the, um, in the question of, of, of carbon. Um, it's true that the only paragraph that is there uh, is a kind of a strong comment. I think to be fair, not with the very idea, but with how it is operating now the market. So I think the criticism is more, um, and I think the criticism comes from an European perspective, uh, that I think also that the European Union has tried to be a little more attentive or engaged with this carbon market. So it's true that probably it's an issue that should have taken more interest in the text. Uh, probably the response is a bit uh, quicker, just claiming that the, the market of carbon market is not working. And, and maybe you can read from India, from here, and I think it's a legitimate way of reading is, well, uh, the Encyclical has no interest on in this market. I also can read another way. I think it bit, maybe it's a bit unfair way of reading is because you say it doesn't work, that doesn't mean it will, will not work in future, for example. So I think this is another fair way of reading this. And I feel much more comfortable with this way of reading. Uh, and I think that if it works, or it works better, uh, I'm convinced that uh, it will be uh, not only accepted but supported because I think with this community that is a religious community all over the world, um, what he's trying to say is that it's such an important issue that we want to show our commitment and our engagement with the discussions. So at this stage, uh, I would uh, start uh, asking the public to, to talk, to give comments, questions. If there are, yeah, please identify yourself because, uh, you know, we are live streaming. Some people from outside our conference is here and we know each other now, but. You can come here and, and, and do it from here while, while uh, no, no, just, just. Uh, hi, thank you for the nice uh, talks that is going on. My name is Miguel. I work for the CTW in Germany. And I have a question uh, because uh, through the talking, it, it gives the impression that compensating household is not really an issue. So we'll carry on with the carbon taxing and uh, compensating is not an issue. But I have a question in these regards because uh, at the moment when we analyze how to compensate households, we use uh, standard econometric methods, for example, to, to see welfare improving in these policies. My question is that now some researchers are talking about um, inequality of opportunities and all of this kind of stuff. In the, in the compensating measure that you talk, or you mentioned, you mentioned, for example, uh, energy efficiency improvements, but then you face the problem that what happens if a household is renting the, the place? So do you improve the, 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 the efficiency of the dwelling and then who is benefiting in the long run is the owner, not the, not the, not the, not the, not the, not the tenant? And then things like this, like um, you cannot increase or decrease the, the, the labor tax because uh, these people are already paying less taxes. So what is really a compensating measure that is going to help them? And in this context of 
because in my, in, my, in, my, in my impression, there is no research that is proving how this transference of compensated measures are breaking this uh, line that is uh, worrying a, a lot of researchers in terms of inequality of opportunities. Thank you. Thanks. So th those are interesting issues. I think my first reaction to the observations you make about the broader context of um, equity within which we might think about these issues is that there is a, there's a general presumption in economics that actually many, uh, in many policy areas, one can separate questions of distributional equity from questions of efficiency and that the um, to the extent that we have concerns about equity, concerns about distributional fairness in society, that the form in which redistribution should take should be general. Um, it shouldn't be achieved by adjusting and manipulating particular areas of policy, but should be achieved by essentially giving, giving the poor more income and allowing them to choose what they do with their income, rather than deciding that they should have particular additional quantities of particular commodities um, and, and, you know, or, or that the, the distributional dimension should be factored into all areas of policy. And I think in general here, that's certainly a position I'd want to take, that in the main concerns about distribution and concerns about the impact of environmental policy on helping or not helping the poor um, are questions that really raise general questions about equity in society and should be dealt with in that way. I think the concerns that I've got about equity or the interests I've got in thinking about questions of equity um, in, in relation to carbon taxes really relate to two particular um, aspects. One is that I think politically it may be very difficult to make the changes in energy prices that we might want to see without being seen to tackle effectively the concerns about the impact on the poorest in our society. Um, and I think the, the rapid rise to prominence of this issue in one or two countries, um, I think, signals that. And I, I remember well, um, 20 years ago, the, the thing that really started Mrs. Thatcher's decline was the failure to recognize um, the adverse effects of um, higher energy taxes um, on poorer households. Um, so I think you know, one aspect of it is simply that it's, you know, it will be necessary if we're to devise policies that achieve political consent and that are durable that we tackle, tackle these things. The other aspect is that I think there are, there are linkages between the efficient response to, um, energy, to, to carbon pricing and our ability to tackle some of these issues. We may find that actually we have a group of households who are seriously constrained in the way that they use energy um, by various market failures, the failure of their landlord to insulate their, um, their housing and so on and so forth. I think there would be a strong case, in fact, given how pervasive the market failures relating to housing tenure seem to be, I think there would be a strong case for the government simply paying for better insulation of the housing occupied by low-income renters. And I think we'd all benefit from the reduction of that constraint um, on, um, on, on climate um, on, on climate pricing, um, but but I think they're really those two dimensions, rather than seeking to use environmental policy as the mechanism for tackling what is, I think, a much wider question about fairness and, and equity in society. If there are no more questions. I would like to come back to Stephen's uh, comment on intergenerational issues and how to deal with them. Because uh, last Friday we had uh, Lord Stern here in, in, in Florence and basically uh, he was presenting his new book and there is a chapter on philosophy and because he thinks that philosophy has to have a, an important role in discussing these issues. So perhaps I I would like uh, to have some feedback from the panel or from the public on, on, on how, how to deal with this, with this really difficult topic of you know, long-term effects. And we know from, 
from the work of Professor Weizmann that this is not uh, a minor issue, hmm? that this may be really uh, a big, big issue. It's difficult because theoretically we are the people, we are supposed not to have children, so. <laughs> So maybe we are the less uh, uh, that should talk about this. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a very it's a very difficult issue because when we understand, I mean, the disc any discourse on on ethics or morals, uh, we are talking about um, human action in a context, and the action uh, has to to occur in a in a period that. Can be handled. I mean, in terms of an action and the, what and the effects have to be handled by the individual or the or the community, uh, and and this is going. This goes a little. This goes much further. So, because he's talking about something we have to do for some people that we don't know yet, or something we have to stop doing or not to do. So morally, I think the value is much more important because. When you are doing for some, something for somebody is in front of you, good or bad, uh, the punishment of the retribution can happen immediately or, or close. But to do something for people, let's go to take the good side, to do something good for some people, and you cannot get any retribution and recognition for this, uh, morally has a stronger value. So. We all understand that if somebody goes to the war to defend my country and this person dies defending my country, this person doesn't know me, yeah? but I feel uh, that this person has done something important for me. He or she has protected me. So we recognize a value of the heroism or the sacrifice of the people doing things for people who they don't know or they don't know immediately. Uh, so I think moral is a strong value. How we can incorporate this is in the discourse today uh, to take political actions, or in, I think it's very difficult. It's very difficult because it's a kind of um, argument that moves some passion for a moment, but it's very difficult to keep this in long, long term, in the long run. Uh, I'm ready to sacrifice for the people I love, Maybe I'm ready to sacrifice for the people that I suppose they can love me if they, because they belong to my community, but it's much more difficult to go beyond this point. So I think from an ethical point of view, uh, all the discussion of future generation has a strong moral value. And any position taking into account this and trying to adapt behavior today in order to protect people for future morally uh, I think should be much more recognized or have a, a strong degree of recognition and appreciation. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess I think, you know, the, the, the practical issues are that, you know, countries have made these uh, mitigation pledges for uh, Paris. The pledges typically to cut emissions by, say, 25, 30 percent by 2030 relative to some. Uh, baseline level uh, emissions that would have otherwise have occurred or emissions in 2005, and those are going to need substantial carbon prices, um, either direct carbon prices or implicit carbon prices through uh, regulations, but uh, typically $50, $100 per tonne, maybe more than that. Um, in addition, uh, you know, there, there are estimates of uh, the, the environmental damages from uh, uh, carbon, and they're, they're very sensitive to assumptions about discount rates, but even if you use market discount rates, they're still quite big, maybe $35, $40 uh, per tonne. Maybe they're a lot bigger uh, if, if you apply lower discount rates to uh, give, more, give future generations uh, more weight. Maybe they're 100, maybe they're 200. Maybe you, when you account for the risk of catastrophes, maybe it's 100, 200, 200. But I mean, the fact is, at the moment, the global average CO2 price is about $1. We have 12% of emissions formally priced, and typically prices are less than $10 per tonne. So the globally average price at the moment is about $1. So um, 
I think the main focus, the main practical focus has to be on how do we start the, the process of uh, moving towards uh, higher carbon prices. Maybe in the long run we need to go to $70, $200, but for now, for the next 15 years, the issue is how do we phase in carbon prices that are going to help countries move towards their mitigation pledges. So carbon prices of $20, $30, $40, $50 or, or more. Um, so, I mean, I think those are the practical, and, and uh, you know, how, how can these policies be put in place? Um, how can policymakers deal with the adverse uh, impacts on uh, low-income families? What specific measures should be taken in different countries? I think these are the key issues that we need to be focused on right now, um, uh, despite this uh, important, uh, but to me, a bit more theoretical debate about whether carbon prices now should be uh, substantially higher than $40 per tonne because of uh, different assumptions about discounting and catastrophes and so on. So for, first, can, I think... Can, can you oh, identify... Peter Crampton, University of Maryland, uh, EUI. Um, and EUI. Uh, first, I'd like to say that the, the, the remarks of so far of the roundtable I found uh, brilliant, quite illuminating. I agree with everyone. Uh, and, I, uh, and, and that's actually very nice because there's quite a broad perspective that is being presented, but uh, you all seem quite sensible. So that's very nice. Um, the, to Ian's point, uh, which I think is the right thing, I think what we need to do is find a way to uh, motivate uh, governments to cooperate, to work for the common good. And I think that the way I would sum it up is in seven words. Price carbon, which it seems everyone agrees, and I will if you will. Uh, reciprocal commitments among a, co a broad coalition of the willing, and then we make the coalition of the willing broad by addressing redistribution. And it's not just redistribution. I think the, the distribution aspect is, that, that we, uh, that's most important here is the distribution not within a country, poor people versus wealthy people in the UK, but rather across the enormous heterogeneity of countries because uh, we have to get countries like India and Brazil and, and so on on board. And uh, that's the, 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 the big redistribution that's, that's needed. And I think that we, uh, we can do that. And if you do do that, then it will uh, lead to a stronger, more durable uh, commitment that will last and then grow as people see its accomplishment. But absolutely, we need, I mean, the beauty of price is it is a direct general instrument that hits everything in our economy. And, and that's exactly, and this is Stephen's point, which is right on, that's exactly what we need. Uh, and the, so, yeah, so we're, we're I think, we have a lot of good ideas here. I hope they'll uh, also be voiced in uh, Paris. Well, I guess I'd like to ask you, what, I mean, what specific mechanism do you have in mind? Uh, I mean, I, I don't see countries at the moment, particularly in these days of uh, historically high debt to GDP ratios, uh, for going a, a potentially substantial revenue source and uh, you know, sending it overseas. Um, I mean, the, the mechanism on the table at Paris is, is climate finance. That's how developing countries are hoping. So is that uh, what you have in mind, scaling up climate finance or some new mechanism? Um, well, uh, yeah, a green fund, but actually a new mechanism that actually people find more attractive because they see that the money is being used so effectively. I think that's what makes people willing to spend when they see it being used properly. I mean, a big problem, you know, why are people not willing, why don't they like taxes, why don't they like government? Some certain segment in the United States certainly feels that way. And the reason is they think, well, the money is just wasted. And so if people have a perception that 
the, the green fund is just a, a, a wasteland, then they won't want to contribute to it. But if it's a system that's, in, that, that's incredibly efficient and effective at what it does, then it will be endorsed. And I think that that can happen, and we just have to design it. And, and, and yes, I've had some papers that have presented a straw man that's sort of a first step at, at what something could look like, but that's where I think we need a lot of research to, to develop that straw man see, and, and variations and its properties, and uh, then with a very strong uh, and effective uh, green fund, it, it will expand. So it's, it is basically expansion of the, the green fund. Please, over there. Hi, uh, I'm Thomas Sturck, a PhD student at UPF and LSE. Um, what I'd like to know is, we've heard from everyone that all the economists m in general, not only on this panel, but in general, agree that a carbon pricing regime is what's needed to fix climate policy. And that's a very rare occasion where uh, all economists basically agree on the same set of policy. But still, we don't seem to be very good in getting this point across to the electorate. As Martin Weizmann has said, there's several people on the left, for example, they think it's too capitalist to have a carbon tax, but there are also very many people that think a carbon tax or even uh, an emission trading scheme is too much state interference. And so I wonder how we could get these sectors on board or whether we are actually mistaken in how good the argument is. Anyone wants to get back to this? Quickly, I mean, in our view, I mean, um, typically in countries, the most powerful ministry is the finance ministry. It's not the environmental ministry. So what we've been trying to do is uh, convene meetings of finance ministries to emphasize that they need to be uh, uh, heavily engaged in the climate issue. Uh, and that uh, uh, they're the key ministry. They, they, can, uh, uh, they can administer carbon taxes. They can use this revenue for broader fiscal uh, reform. Um, and it's, you know, in our view, a carbon tax is better than the sort of trading systems we've seen to date because the trading systems have focused downstream on uh, industrial sources, and so they've missed about half of the emissions, emissions from um, homes and vehicles and so on. To us, it makes a lot more sense to have carbon pricing upstream on fuel supply. A very simple, straightforward extension of what uh, governments, nearly all governments in uh, advanced and uh, developing countries are already doing and doing very well, administering uh, uh, fuel charges, so just uh, uh, building carbon charges into road fuel excises, extend those to other petroleum products, coal and natural gas, and then use most of the revenues to cut other taxes. That's our very simple message. Um, and so we're hoping to get finance ministers more engaged in this issue and uh, uh, create momentum uh, that way. But. Well, it's just very interesting how all this is going to play out. These countries have mitigation pledges for 2030, so they're going to be under pressure to um, uh, do something. Um, and they're going to be evaluating a wide range of uh, options. I think the case for carbon pricing is especially attractive, and it's especially attractive for finance ministers because of the uh, revenue, particularly in these days of uh, high fiscal pressures, which aren't going to go away. You know, the US, the UK have historically very high uh, debt to GDP ratios. So there are a lot of factors that are suggesting that a perfect storm of factors is coming together uh, that could create the right conditions for carbon pricing. But well, we'll just have to see what happens over the next 15 years. Um, just briefly to um, say one thing that may not be apparent to the, um, the people watching who, are not, who have not been present in, uh, in the workshop um, today. Um, a lot of what we've been discussing in the academic discussion today has been um, discussion of emissions trading. And certainly to us as economists, emissions trading and... Um, taxing carbon are, um, not, if not equivalent, are very similar instruments with bo both of which share the property that they achieve their effects by pricing carbon and by establishing a price signal that um, encourages people to shift away from using carbon-based energy. Um, so you know, I, don't, I don't think there is any, necessarily any presumption in the discussion um, that 
um, emissions trading in some sense is to be abandoned and that we're, we're all talking about carbon taxes. That may or may not be the right way to go in the long run, but um, I think emissions trading is here, um, is, is working and achieving emissions reductions in Europe and may well be part of the template for policy um, in, in the coming years um, in, in quite a lot of countries as well. But what needs to be said about emissions trading is that the crucial thing about emissions trading is not just the fact that it's trading, but that it's trading that takes place in the context of a constraint. The thing that makes emissions trading achieve an environmental outcome that's worth having is that it makes carbon scarce, that it caps the amount of um, carbon that can be used, it caps emissions, and without that cap, carbon would have no value in a trading system and trading would be pointless, but that the intervention that sets the cap is absolutely crucial. And I think there is no escaping the fact that what we're proposing here is, um, as, as you pointed out, is, is regulation. There is a need for regulatory intervention in one form or another in the, in the workings of the market economy. The market economy will not fix climate change on its own. And that what we need to think of is, is, um, is the best and least costly way of intervening to achieve the changes in behavior that, um, that we ultimately need if we're to reduce climate change. Well, uh, actually I'm moderator, but uh, given that your question I mean, uh, deals with some research that we did in, in, in Spain some time ago, I may intervene now. Uh, so, so basically what we wanted to know is why people uh, you know, were, no, were not very favorable to, 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 to pricing in general. Of environmental problems. So, so more or less, the 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 answer to this in in our study was first of all, many many people think that they are not responsible. That other people are, you know, I mean, like business or governments are responsible of climate change mitigation. So therefore, I mean, they don't see the reason why they should pay uh, um, a carbon tax or or something similar. Second. There are distributional concerns. Many people, when, when, they, when they see carbon price, I mean, they, they just think, okay, it goes to the energy. This is really bad for the, I mean, this is quite generalized in society. You can see it in the, in the street, right? And finally, at least in the case of, of Spain, uh, when, you, when you were asking about this kind of uh, carbon price, um, basically nobody bought it. You know, as, as, a, as a single policy instrument, because I think that there is a mistrust of politicians. Or so, so at the end, when 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 you presented the policy package, the reaction was much better in the sense that perhaps you know, there, yeah, there is a carbon tax, but uh, you know, the revenues were um, earmarked to in part to, to offset distributional concerns and in part to promote renewables. So, so perhaps that's part of the question. I don't know how. This can be uh, applied to other to other countries, but I guess that you know it's not uh, it's not very far away from the opinions of of other advanced countries. More questions, uh, uh, Claudio. Uh, Claudio Marcantonini, Florence uh, School of Regulation. Um, I want to make a comment on the, the relation between uh, the problem of equity and the problem of climate policy. Uh, I share the view of, <coughs> of Martin that uh, the two are different problems and, uh, and uh, you can use different uh, uh, instruments for both. But I think <coughs> there are important uh, uh, relations between these two that, uh, that uh, we should take in account and also economists should take in account. Uh, I want pointed out the two. One is uh, uh, damage because damage of climate policy will impact mostly uh, uh, poor country, poor people. So the risk, with the risk of increasing inequality, and second on the cost, uh, <coughs> this was already mentioned, is that um, uh, I mean eventually uh, to reduce carbon in whatever form we want will be costly. So and this cost should be paid by society. And uh, the society should pay costs for something that will not benefit. So, because of this intergenerational, practically, uh, we 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 have to pay now in order to avoid uh, problems to you know, our children or our grandchildren and so on. And uh, um, my thing is that 
if there's not a perception that these costs are distributed somehow equally among both among countries but also within the countries among different uh, um, household um, I think it will be harder to to justify and will be harder for people to accept uh, uh, to pay and uh, so I, I think this is an important issue because without acceptance of of, of population with a large acceptance that it will be there's no willing to to, to, to do it and so we, we, we will not solve the problem thank you I'm Theo Zakariadis from the Cyprus University of Technology in Cyprus uh, continuing this discussion um, we all agree that carbon pricing uh, can be effective and also can uh, help us uh, combat all these distributional issues. And uh, we agree that this is not something easily accepted by politicians and by the public. Uh, the IMF may be trying uh, very well to convince finance ministers. Finance ministers, of course, may consider whether they can convince their prime ministers and their electorates. And you mentioned some of the issues that the public may be, um, uh, the reasons why the public may be reluctant. I think it is our responsibility to, to try to, uh, to find, uh, to, to, to search uh, in more detail how we can affect um, public behavior. Um, could it be uh, through uh, insights from psychology or from behavioral economics? Um, could it be uh, through more dedicated campaigns? Because uh, we have the experience talking to policymakers and members of parliaments, even in countries where uh, fiscal uh, deficits may not be a problem, and even if we explain in detail that such environmental fiscal reforms may be revenue neutral and may not lead to additional tax burdens, still we find uh, a quite positive response, but without any continuation, as if this were just a luxury. So uh, I don't know if anyone has some experiences from positive uh, results of the, from the implementation of such reforms, and to what extent we can uh, benefit from, from other disciplines uh, in order to be more successful. More comments, questions from the public? Yeah. Thank you, Kathleen Schubert, Paris School of Economics. I want to, to answer you, your question to, to talk about the, the case of France. So, uh, there has been a, a failure, an introduction of the carbon tax that have failed, President Sarkozy, to 2009. And there has been another attempt uh, two years ago that has succeeded. So that, that is what I, what, I, what I want to talk about. And the fact that was that uh, uh, it came, it succeeded because it came, because it came unnoticed. Because we introduced the, the tax at rate zero, or almost zero, very, very, very small rate. And uh, there is a profile, an increasing profile in the, in the law, in the finance law. So it is here, it is small, but the profile is there. So if uh, Governments uh, commit uh, uh, do what they, they are committed to do. It will uh, it will work in the end. So it's a kind of a, how could I say a, a trick, okay, to introduce the tax, but a very very small rate. Yeah. Thank you. There is another question in, in the back. Yeah. I am Marco Casari from the University of Bologna and EUI. Um, the debate on distribution has focused on mitigation costs, right? Like putting a carbon tax. The other side of the problem is uh, the asymmetric impact of the climate change that is going to happen, okay, in internationally. So the damage from uh, climate change is going to um, be heavier, for example, in the tropical areas compared to temperate areas. But there are, you know, 
if you think about sea level rises or other aspects, you know, very asymmetric impacts. Now, this has distributional, uh, you know, uh, has to do with distribution, okay? So my curiosity, and I would like to ask this question to the panel, is um, about if there are mechanisms in place or we can think of mechanisms to compensate, okay, um, countries in, in a differential way according to the damage that they are going to experience because of uh, climate change. Okay. So uh, think about you know, if there are going to be mass migrations out of some countries toward other countries, for example. No? I don't know, li uh, law scholars, for example, can think about a framework to identify um, environmental refugees, which now, you know, it's not something that has any legal status in, in the international arena. This could be a, a very useful uh, um, concept to, to develop among academics in order to uh, be able to handle future mass migrations that may be triggered also by climate change. So my question is, um, you know, can economists um, give a contribution to set up a mechanism, maybe, you know, like an automatic mechanism that will intervene in case of a, a, a climate shock in some countries versus others, or, um, or is there any literature on this? Yeah, perhaps do you want to uh, build on, on your comments on adaptation and, 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 and the, the, the green funds? And yeah, uh, I mean, this? Th th those are really good questions. So, um, I mean, one issue is um, with the existing climate finance, how much of it should go to adaptation and what rules uh, should we develop taking into account? Uh, h how should we allocate it across countries taking into account their vulnerability, uh, the efficiency of the potential efficiency of the spending, taking into account equity issues? So that's one set of issues, and you're quite right. I think we need uh, to carefully study practical rules for uh, allocating that uh, finance, which is going to be a growing source of uh, money we need to uh, uh, make productive use of. And then this debate about whether to have this um, loss and damage fund, which would uh, automatically compensate countries in the event of a uh, climate disaster. Um, but I think you're quite right. Um, the focus has been on more like a natural disasters and things that we can quantify. There's been less discussion of well, what, what do we do in the future if there's a, a risk of severe migration between countries or maybe even conflicts over um, change in, changes in um, water resources in neighboring countries caused by, climate, caused by climate change. So, I mean, I think you raised some very important issues and uh, they need to be very carefully studied and then uh, 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 then how can we build that sort of research into the uh, design of these uh, um, emerging systems, the, the uh, climate finance uh, for adaptation and the possible loss and damage fund? What practicable rules can we develop to uh, um, allocate this, this funding efficiently and fairly? Um, so far we've been talking about, uh, you know, the distributional effects of climate change, which, of course, I mean, you, you, you can oppose or you can compare to the distributional effects of carbon pricing, for instance. But do we, as economists, know a lot, not know a lot about the distributional effects of different climate policies, like standards, because all Climate policies have distributional effects. I mean, but probably they are more hidden, right? So renewable policy has distributional effects, right? And there are some people who worked on this. Um, other, you know, standards may have, as I, uh, technological standards. Can we give um, uh, an answer on this from from from, from our profession? I think, in fact, one of the most remarkable things is how some areas of environmental policy have been able to implement um, reforms that have had really quite remarkable um, distributional effects across households or that have had really quite remarkable effects on energy costs to households that I think would have been very difficult to implement 
or would have been much more politically painful to implement um, in the form of explicit taxation. If, when I look at the UK, we have for many years now had a system in which households have paid substantial additional amounts on their energy bills to finance um, non-carbon based energy, to finance nuclear power, to finance um, renewables. And that if you compare that with the impact of the um, EU emissions trading system on household energy bills, or if you compare that with the um, rate of value added tax on domestic energy, which turned out to be, which has become so politically um, uh, toxic that no government is willing to talk about it, it's absolutely extraordinary. Household energy bills in the UK have risen by much more than would have been involved in imposing value-added tax um, on domestic energy at the full rate, um, without anyone apparently being aware that this is happening. And I think the, the understanding of the, um, the, the, the cost impacts of climate policy and of renewables policy um, and the the constraints, as it were, that that understanding places on rational policy making are, are actually really rather uncomfortable. Um, and I think it would be you know, a much more transparent and open climate policy would in principle be desirable rather than this patchwork of essentially concealed and hidden um, costs and subsidies. But I think it, it, um, it would expose decision makers to much greater, um, I think, scrutiny over the impact on household bills and the distributional impact on households um, than, than the current rather random patchwork of policy. Just one quick note that with, with standards, uh, regulations that don't raise revenue, you're kind of stuck with the distributional effect. You can't do anything. <laughs> Whereas the nice thing about uh, carbon pricing is that you raise revenues, you can then use some of those revenues to uh, compensate and then alter the distributional impact of the whole policy package. There was, uh, there was one question over there. First, uh, there was uh, Massimo. Yeah. Yes, Massimo Filippini, ETH Zurich. Just coming back to this, um, to the discussion on standard, uh, and I think it's very, very important because the, uh, what I call is, is, the, is the invisible hand that is redistributing <coughs> the effects, but not in the right way. And uh, if you look uh, from the historical point of view, just consider the building codes. We, we save 300% energy, uh, well, we reduce the energy consumption per square meters by 300%. And no one mentioned something. We didn't have huge discussion. Why? Because of course, from the political economy point of view, the introduction of a new, uh, code is relatively easy. You will not have discussion because only the f in the future you will be affected. Now, the, uh, this is the, uh, in Switzerland, recently we had a referendum on uh, ecological tax reform. 80% of the people say no. And uh, I think as economists, of course, we say, well, first best, first best, carbon pricing. But sometimes I ask myself, if we don't uh, concentrate the discussion on a second best, and standard for me play a, an important role. Of course, as mentioned by Jan, this does, does not solve the redistribution. But people, because uh, we also should consider that uh, we have behavioral failures. And people, they are very short run oriented. And also, if we are talking about carbon uh, <coughs> CO2 emissions, related to fossil fuels means that we have a long-term investment behind any CO2 emissions. And then this behavioral failure is becoming more and more important. I think uh, we should, uh, sometimes I think we focus too much on carbon pricing, carbon pricing, and maybe we have other solutions that in the past, of course as economists I am not so in favor, but in the past uh, were relatively effective. Yeah, Thijs. Uh, Thijs Jong, University of Groningen. Um, um, what, I, what I was thinking about how we can, I would say, um, yeah, get a change in, in, in the morals of people is that, uh, as it is now, um, yeah, a carbon property right is actually a right on yeah, a ton of CO2. And CO2 is, at least indirectly, it's lethal. 
it takes some time maybe, but in the end it will, yeah, it will harm us. So, and that's, I think, in a way, the, the paradox of it is that we, yeah, if you have trading, they are trading with lethal products in a way. So um, what I was thinking about, and I wonder what you think of it, is if we say we live in a 2100 or 2200 and we live in a carbon-free society, then it should be treated as such that it is lethal. So I think, but why why shouldn't it be treated as uh, as a liability instead of a property right? In that and then you know if you if you're using a product and it is it, it has any carbon with it, yeah, then you are at risk of you know being penalized right away. I think that that's a, that's maybe an issue because um, I know don't know another way how we can really get that get that uh, finished in the end. We should really look at it from a, from a long term perspective. And if we know that, and if we communicate it to the public, like that in the future we will treat it as such, I think people will change their their their, their way of how they will treat carbon. Simone. Thank you, Simone Borghese, University of Siena. Um, building on the discussion concerning the different instruments. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to know your opinion about the risk of overlapping different instruments. So for instance, one problem is that renewable policies might overlap and get in conflict somehow with the ETS system. And there are strong opinions in, in favor or against the existence of this overlapping. I think this is important also for the distributional impact of uh, different instruments and the proper mix of them. Um, just to, to, to make an initial response to that, I think you know, there are circumstances in which multiple instruments can have a role to play. They can, um, I think, as um, as Professor Weizmann has shown um, in important work he's done in the past, there's, um, there's a sense in which the use of multiple instruments um, can be used to respond to uncertainty in the, um, the effects of um, any individual instrument. And I think that um, that aspect might well, in some circumstances, justify a, an instrument portfolio. I think the one anxiety I have is that actually policy proceeds, I think, far too often by the accumulation of instruments, one on top of another, and that actually some of the instruments that are left layered underneath the, the current most fashionable instrument may be made redundant without necessarily, without kind of a careful appraisal as to whether they're still currently needed. Um, I think there are, it's very, very clear with emissions trading when that happens, the price falls to zero, um, when um, other instruments are, or other policies are introduced that basically um, ensure that the cap no longer binds, that emissions are reduced without the need for um, the emissions trading scheme to do its work. Um, but more generally, I think there are circumstances in which we probably end up with a quite a complex portfolio of policies, some of which tug in different directions, not necessarily with a particularly rational um, overall structure, and yet I think clearing away the debris of past policy making, and particularly clear, clearing away policy mistakes, is much, much harder than, um, than simply adding things on, on, on top of the superstructure. So I think, I think here is an area of policy where um, it's very important that in, you know, to avoid excessive costs in long-run adjustment, that we, as far as possible, choose policy instruments that provide a clear signal for cost-effective abatement. Um, single carbon price supplying uniformly across industrial sectors as the primary form of intervention um, is the approach that seems to me to hold out the best prospect of achieving emission reductions without excessive cost and without redundant regulation um, and we are talking about something that will be a major intervention in the workings of the market economy. We are talking about something that will impose significant economic cost of adjustment. Um, this is not going to be painless, this is not going to be costless. And I think choosing the most cost-effective um, instrument portfolio 
the most cost-effective form of intervention is actually going to be really quite important. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sensitive to the reasons that one might end up adding additional instruments to the portfolio. There may well be cases where there is not just a single market failure involved, but a number of market failures. There may be cases where um, uncertainties about the impact of one instrument require us to buttress the instrument with others. But I think, ultimately, a clean, clear policy signal um, through pricing um, is going to be really the, the, uh, the thing that will minimize economic cost. Peter Crampton again. So I completely agree with uh, everything uh, Stephen has said again. And just to, uh, I think one of the things, so we all agree carbon pricing is great. We need to educate people on it and convince people that it's a good idea, figure out some behavioral ways. Uh, so tr perhaps trick them into uh, uh, adopting it and then uh, gradually increase it. I think all those are good ideas. But I think one thing that hasn't been said very much so far is why we are where we are with essentially in many countries, certainly in the United States, and I, I believe in Europe as well, we have just literally thousands of policies, subsidies, uh, that work in ways that no economist or collection of economists could possibly figure out how, all the interactions. Uh, and why are we where we are? It's because of how politics works. It's driven by special interests, and the politicians like subsidies are effectively a way of awarding out uh, rewards for support in political elections and so on. And so that, that leads us down not to second best or third best, to, but to 14th best and 27th best, and uh, where lots of money is being spent, as you pointed out in the UK, in Germany, in the United States, Lots of money is being spent, and much of it is doing very little. And it's because we've gone down this slippery slope of subsidies, uh, which is really a, a very ineffective way. Uh, and certainly there's some exceptions. Uh, some, some very basic standards are, 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 are probably the most expedient way to address certain aspects. But it's not the broad general instrument that we need. Thank you. I received um, a question from Jean-Michel Glachand, who is director of FSR. Uh, he's on his way to Paris. I guess he's watching us from the airport or somewhere. <laughs> so he's asking, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to, to direct this question to probably to, to you, Jose Ignacio, or, or Ian afterwards, or, 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 or Marty. Um, is it realistic to say that the EU has an EU European climate policy, and this may, you know, make us think that we are doing much, and uh, perhaps, you know, in terms of distributional uh, issues, uh, you know, we, we may think that we are already doing much for the planet, or is it only a word put by the EU countries? What's your opinion on this from Brussels and from, us, okay. uh, from Washington? An non-expert non opinion, okay, yes, <laughs> kind of public opinion. Um, I think the people of the European Union is convinced they have this European policy, and extremely convinced. And probably this helps a lot when it comes to international negotiation, because <clears throat> I think it would be very bad if, if those who have to negotiate, they think they have not uh, a real policy. So in that sense, I think it's, I th they, they think they have, and and I think it's good. And then second, I think it's true. I think there is an European policy. Uh, I don't fully agree in some of the uh, on the convictions of the European policy, but in general, I think it's, it's fair. And I would say it tries to be generous. And I know this word is not very useful in the policy environment, but I think it tries to be generous. So uh, in that sense, I think the European Union is playing a good role looking at international negotiations of climate change. Uh, I don't think it's something to be selfish because it's not, maybe a little proud sometimes, and all, never they forget the interest. I think the interests are always there. But 
I, I feel that when you look at the positions, that they are um, hidden, never clear, or not so clear. Uh, to me, uh, there is a kind of a list. Uh, certainly, there is a position, and I would say even generous. Yeah. Would you like to? Well, just very simply, I mean, yeah, I mean, Europe clearly has like a, a, a climate policy and it's moving in the right direction, but um, there's a lot of scope for reform. It's the, the trading system covers less than half of the emissions. The prices are less than where they need uh, to be to reflect environmental damages or ultimately meet the uh, uh, emissions reduction pledges for uh, Paris. And then we would say that uh, uh, the fiscal opportunities haven't been uh, fully exploited. The opportunity, you know, a lot of these allowances have been auctioned. Uh, and we, we would, so, sorry, a lot of the allowances have been given away for free. And to us, that's diverting a valuable source of revenue away from treasuries, which by definition means that uh, other taxes have to be higher than they uh, otherwise would be if those allowances were auctioned with the revenues going to the uh, Treasury. So, I mean, you know, Europe's moving, uh, but we just think there's a, um, a lot of scope for uh, reforming the programme. More questions from the public? We are, we have a few minutes left. So, yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Bryce, I'm a student of PhD here in Florence. And I'm totally out of the field. And uh, as an economist, I was thinking that we have been speaking about uh, distributive policies, but you have always been speaking about uh, flat tax. So you can tell to the electorate, yeah, we're going to put a flat tax on income. They will probably not like it. Tell the electorate, I'm going to put a flat tax on carbon emissions. They might not like it as well. You have a Ferrari, big house, uh, big ship. You pay flat, I have a little, my little car and my little flat uh, without heating, I pay flat as well. I don't know if this has been thought before, but uh, to me it's somehow striking. I mean, I, I guess uh, I would address that on the uh, use of revenues. So rather than introducing a uh, discontinuous pricing system for carbon, I think uh, I would address those distributional concerns with the recycling of the carbon pricing revenues, make, making sure that we adequately compensate low-income households and have a balanced overall, uh, have, a, have a policy that's fair by uh, judicious use of the uh, revenues rather than introducing staggered carbon prices. Because the beauty of the carbon price is, you know, minimization of, 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 of cost of abatement and, and, and you, you achieve this with, with the flat. Uh, you know, I think maybe we could learn a lot from uh, the experience of a successful province of Canada, British Columbia, that introduced a comprehensive tax on carbon emissions. And I mean, this is covering 100% of carbon emissions. Uh, this has been successful. This has been accepted by the population. And some of the lessons are this. When this carbon tax uh, was proposed, it was proposed along with concrete, specific uh, instructions or measures on who is going to get the rebate. And basically, it was there was an equal check made out to every man, woman, and child in British Columbia. And they wisely sent the checks first before they started collecting, uh, collecting the taxes. So there was this clear, direct link to see that they were not uh, pouring these tax revenues into dumping them in the Pacific Ocean or something like that. And the system has worked quite well uh, to the extent that um, at first this was resisted by the business community, by other communities, by anybody who didn't like taxes. This was resisted. It passed on a referendum narrowly. Um, then years later, a few years ago, uh, actually these voices were heard again. Let's get rid of this tax uh, on, uh, on, on carbon. But now it was an entrenched position. If you want to get rid of the tax on carbon, what tax do you want to increase now? And when it was reversed in that fashion, this tax was suddenly popular. 
there was no meaningful alternative for raising revenues because it was seen clearly that if you reduce the taxation on carbon, you must say where you're going to get the increase from, and that turned the coin around. So I think these are some useful lessons that uh, it should be, that the carbon tax should somehow be made antiseptic, so it's clean, it's saying what exactly we're going to do with these revenues, and this is probably a good idea. An equal check is written out to every citizen uh, in the country on a, on, a, on a relative basis, and once it gets entrenched, uh, vested interests will arise that don't want a tax on them at the expense of this carbon tax. Uh, so uh, labor unions don't want to have uh, extra tax on labor income. Uh, capitalists don't want extra taxes on capitalism. So um, I think the lesson here from that experiment in British Columbia, which is highly successful, uh, it covers everything, it's uniform, is that there should be a clear-cut um, uh, 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 combination of attacks on carbon along with explicit instructions, as it were, uh, or directives on how this revenue was going to be transformed, that it wouldn't increase this ministry or that ministry or anything, to try to get away from this uh, distributional issue by making it look like what it is, an equal bonus for every citizen. There are no more questions from the public. I would like to, ra to raise uh, at least uh, this uh, distributional issue uh, related to, to keeping hydrocarbons under the ground. I mean, last uh, week, and you know, Nicholas Stern was mentioning this that almost two thirds of, of current proved reserves have to be kept underground so that we can comply with, with the two degrees. Uh, Otmar Edenhofer also has work on this and, and it's quite clear that, you know, I mean, there is a big issue here and uh, so this is a distributional, huge distributional issue on the owners of these reserves, um, shareholders of these big oil companies, uh, coal companies. Uh, on some countries which are really endowed with this with respect to the others. So how can we deal with this? I mean, how can we manage this uh, from an international point of view? I mean, uh, is, is, is the carbon price, you know, the only response? Which level we would need to have uh, to get this? We would need, uh, you know, some side compensations to these fossil fuel uh, owners. What do you think? I think it would be very difficult um, to persuade um, taxpayers in most countries that they um, should be contributing money to compensate the owners of resource, natural resources for the fact that we were not going to use them. I, I think inevitably regulation imposes gains and losses. Um, the question, it seems to me, in, in all cases, is whether the losses are borne by people who can bear them. And that you know, there may well be some countries in the world where reducing um, the consumption of carbon-based fuels will impose um, discomfort, and we, may need, we should think about those issues. There will, be, um, there, there will be cases where that's true. But I think to devise a principle that we... Um, try, that we can only make pro progress in climate policy if we fully compensate the owners of fossil-based fuels for the uh, reduction in the value of the resources that they own. I think that leads us up a, a serious blind alley, and I, would, uh, I, I think we would need to uh, steer well clear of that in, in international discussion. Any final comment from you? Just one uh, quick comment. Uh, I mean, uh, a, a lot of uh, colleagues in, in, in my division focus on extract, you know, taxation of uh, extractive industries and how to tax these industries from, uh, in terms of uh, trying to get most of the rents in, in the hands of uh, 
the government, and, and so you know they advise on appropriate uh, royalty payments, and it's just well, just a related point is just that uh, that these these royalties are actually quite significant. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's done the calculation, but if you turn them into uh, effective carbon prices, then we are actually taxing the resources quite a lot from a carbon perspective through existing uh, royalties um, at, at the moment. Okay. If there are no more comments from the panel on this or other issues, I'm going to, to close the, the round table. And uh, perhaps I could summarize that uh, we economists are very interested in cost effectiveness, as it was proved uh, during today before coming here and, and here as well. And, and our really real interest in, in carbon pricing, I mean, most of the discussion was uh, on it. And, and, and I would say that carbon prices uh, have many things that uh, we like. But there is one thing that perhaps we don't say much, but it is important, which is transparency. It's a transparent instrument, and, and we are able to see the um, distributional effects as well, both uh, at a global level and also at a national level, which is not the case with other instruments, and, and that probably uh, explains the limited literature existing on, on, on the distributional effects of other policy alternatives. So um, I could also say that, you know, the encyclical letter is very interested in distributional issues. And I think that today uh, we learned a lot. I hope that uh, you know this was useful for, for you. For me, it was very useful to listen to Jose Ignacio and, of course, to my colleagues. But uh, his ideas uh, were more familiar to me. Uh, and I would like to, to thank you all for being here, for your, for your comments, especially to the, to the panelists, uh, to Jose Ignacio, who came here just for the, for the panel, um, although he had a meeting in Rome before, I think, so, <laughs> so it was not uh, that big a trip from Brussels. And, uh, and also to our uh, viewers from somewhere. So thanks uh, for being here, for being, for being there, and, uh, and we close this. Thanks to all.